Hello everyone. I am happy to welcome you all to another stay at home macro podcast episode. So today we're going to be talking about monetary policy and I have two very distinguished guests to help us through that conversation. Uh, before we get started, I do want to recognize that today is Blackout Tuesday. So we're talking today on June 2nd and Jacoba Williams, who is an economist at the Economic Policy Institute, was going to join us on this panel. And for really good reasons, we're, we're gonna do a conversation with her later. I just, I wanna recognize everything that's happening in the United States with blacks and people of color and racism, and let's just pray that things get better really soon. So, um, with that backdrop, now we're gonna talk about the Fed, um, which is, is important. Okay, so today I have Julia Coronado, and Julia is the president and founder of Macro Policy Perspectives. And just to explain to you what that is, so Julia does macro forecasts and comments on the Federal Reserve and has decades of experience in exactly what we're going to talk about today. And Nellie Lang is a senior fellow at the Hutchins Center at the Brookings Institution. So again, the Hutchins Center focuses on monetary policy, fiscal policy, also completely on point for today's conversation. Now, I always like to explain my connections to the guests. And in both cases, Julia and Nellie come from the Federal Reserve Board. And that's where I spent 12 years until I escaped last fall. And, um, <laughs> and Julie is actually on my um, uh, economist family tree at the Federal Reserve. So I made a, a literally a family tree on a little piece of paper of all the economists who had worked on consumer spending. And she is up the tree for me. And, and I mean, as with anything, knowledge uh, transmits from one, one to the next. So she helped me do my job. And, uh, and Nellie, I also met, uh, well, I met Nellie when I was at the, the Fed and started in 2008. And at that time, she was one of the lead economists on financial markets and all the things that were going wrong with them. <sighs> Nellie went on to stand up the Division of Financial Stability at the board, which was trying to make sure 2008 didn't happen again. And um, she also escaped recently and is off at Brookings. And, and all three of us can have a, uh, a more public perspective on monetary policy and what we've learned. And we are all still dedicated to the Fed doing its job even better. So <laughs> that's, you know. Uh, okay, so we're gonna go ahead and start the conversation. And I wanted Julia, as we often do, just to like step back and lay out some of the facts. Like what is happening in the world right now how does the Fed fit into this picture? Like, like what, is, what is going on right now? What's going on right now is we are in a recession and it's a particularly deep recession and uh, a recession being defined by rising unemployment, a la SOM rule, <laughs> um, and contraction in activity. And the catalyst for this recession is uh, a virus that is global and highly infectious and deadly and has come with restrictions on economic activity to avoid transmission and limit transmission. And so the shock to our economy was this virus um, and the associated limitations on activity, um, which have led to, as best we can tell, um, we have we each approach this and triangulate the data in different ways, but we have roughly a quarter of the population unemployed um, right now, and it could will probably go further before it starts to improve. Um, and what we're in the process now is reducing some of those restrictions on activity, and not necessarily because the virus has gotten a lot better, but because we just can't take this restrictions on activity anymore. So we're, we're restarting the economy, but with the presence of a highly infectious and deadly disease. And so we're gonna have to do things differently. And so that takes time to figure out. So it's a huge challenge. It's um, a shock to a lot of 
businesses um, and their employees. And it has meant um, uh, that a lot of people have lost their jobs. A lot of companies are going out of business. And the Fed's role in this and the federal government's role in this is to try to limit that damage um, by, pr by providing a bridge of income to viable businesses who can make it on the other side um, and by providing a bridge of income to consumers who have been sidelined, again, until they can either return to their existing job or find another job. Um, and, and that is a, a challenge of unknown magnitude uh, because we don't know how deep the hole will be that they need to fill. And so they, uh, the Fed acted quickly, the federal government acted quickly, they implemented large programs, um, but will it be enough? Probably not. And so we'll probably have to come back and recalibrate and um, that is all happening in the middle of an election year. And as you say, a lot of tensions in society that probably interact with this economic hardship in a way that um, makes everything a lot more difficult and uncertain. And there's a lot more anxiety in society, generally speaking, um, exacerbated by this economic hardship. Yeah, no, that, that really makes sense. I, one, before we move off of the facts, I, I wanted to ask both of you, what March felt like <laughs> when you were watching. And just to, to start it off, I um, uh, early March, I was on a, um, it was a Bloomberg Wall Street week or something like that. And I can remember sitting in the waiting area, getting ready to my hair and makeup done by the amazing uh, miracle worker there. And, um, <laughs> And I was watching, they had the news on, and um, I could just see the stock ticker, you know, and that was, I think it was around that time, maybe a few days after the, the stock market went into bear territory, and that meaning that it was down 20% from its prior peak. And I just remember, it was like, in, at the beginning, the stock markets were really ahead of the curve in terms of looking out at the global phenomenon and thinking about what that was going to mean. I mean, as soon as Italy shut down, I was like, oh my, we are in for it. We're a lot more like Italy than South Korea. Um, but I just, there was a lot of focus on the stock market and it, in some ways it got the attention of our elected officials uh, for a brief period of time. But my experience in March, and I tried to point this out to people, I said the stock market will come back. The stock market always comes back. I, said, I am absolutely panicked about what's happening in all the other financial markets. Mm -hmm. Like they're seizing up left and right. And the Fed for a while was like doing more, doing more. And like things are still not functioning. And I remember being, well, actually, it got to the point where when the money market uh, funds looked like they were having some trouble, I went and transferred all of my money market mutual funds to my Bank of America account. And I had a friend You're who's an economist. She's like, do that, Claudia. <laughs> yeah, like, but, but they're backstopping the market. It'll be okay. And I was like, you know what? I can get the money out of my ATM a lot faster than out of my Vanguard. Um, so, but I think that was just one where I didn't see people around me who like aren't as deep into like money finance stuff. Like they're like, oh, the stock market, stock market. I was like, nah, this is like, I, I was really, like I knew the Fed was acting and I knew I was kind of overreacting when I put the money in Bank of America, but like to have, to watch them struggle, like as much as they did was really like, it was like a wake up call in a way that, I mean, there were a lot of wake up calls in March. Mm -hmm. I don't know. So I was just curious, because both of you were following, I'm sure what was happening closely. So Nellie, how did, how did you feel in March? Well, so March, I think some of these tensions you raised were there, but from my perspective, it was much more calm than in 2008. Mm -hmm. So we had Julia's going, really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe that's because I wasn't at the Fed anymore, but no, I really... Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> There's a very big difference. And Julia started, this is uh, first and foremost, a health crisis, which affects the real economy, which then affects the financial system. 2008 was something that started with the financial system and hit the real economy. So if you're going to have 
a slowdown, and then you start to realize this is going to be a really sharp fall off. Of course, mm -hmm. financial markets will react and start to fall and start to bring in that information. And I do think there were lots of concerns that the the, the fall was so uncertain, of such uncertain size, that some markets just couldn't kind of figure out, like, how do you price that in? That's not even risk. That's just this broad range of uncertainty. How do you price this? And so some financial markets really did kind of seize up. Those are the kinds of things the Fed can address, though. The Fed can go in and say, this is a liquidity problem. I can, it's, it's not a solvency problem of an institution failing. The Fed is a lender of last resort. It has the tools. And so in early March, way before any of the unemployment numbers were coming out or any of the real data were kind of showing these signs, you know, the Fed was already introducing all these programs, um, pretty, pretty, inter pretty big programs which require unusual and exigent circumstances for them to have the legal authority to do them. Yeah. Um, so they can address those. So in that sense, I wasn't as worried about it. It's not to say that falling asset prices aren't a problem for all kinds of things. But I do think we had a bright spot, that the banks were pretty sound. I mean, their banks' stock prices fell. Their profits are going to go down. Their longer-run profits will be lower because we may be in low interest rate environment for a long time. Um, but there wasn't a concern that any individual institution was going to fail and cause ripples through the economy. So I, so I'm just on that margin. I think the financial sector is stronger. There was clearly surprises, which I'm happy to talk about. Surprises. So it wasn't the banks, but it was surprisingly maybe the treasury markets. You know, and so that's something you wouldn't have expected. Mm -hmm. But yeah. those kinds of um, problems or something a central bank is sort of uniquely situated to help with and is part and part of its main responsibilities. All right, so well, we'll, we'll, we'll come back. To try to reduce some of this downside tail risk and mm -hmm. in ways that, you know, they can help with. They can't, there's longer term consequences that require Congress mm -hmm. and lots of other uh, authorities to respond as well, but in the near term, the Fed could come in um, and help. Yeah, so, no, that's I don't helpful. know, Julia, that's if you like had a much to... more dire outlook. No, no, we can we can balance each other out here. Um, no, and I uh, well, and I'll definitely when we come back to you in just a few minutes, I want you to tell us how how we got to a place where the banking sector wasn't like the next shoe to drop. Yeah, because uh, I know you worked a lot on that. Okay, so Julia, you made more of a face when I was like, how was March? So I will yeah. give me your like thumbnail sketch of what that was like watching the Fed and the market. So right before the Fed acted, um, as Nellie said, I, I mean, I think she framed it really well. It was a totally different catalyst. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was shocking how quickly that a uh, fundamental source of uncertainty became a financial crisis, but we were definitely on the verge of a financial crisis. Mm -hmm. What I saw that was worse than 2008 was the treasury market. Um, and there was a lot of factors going on. Again, just the size of the potential risk was too big for markets to intermediate that risk. It was just too much uncertainty. Then so what do you, what you, do you add by that? What does it mean to intermediate well, risk? So, so when you're asking investors, usually markets work because different people have different views. And if you, you get new information, and that means that the asset, the valuation of a particular asset needs to change. And so there's some buying and some selling going on that um, takes you from the value you were at to the new appropriate value that builds that risk in. But when you can't even quantify the risk or, or how big it is, and it is potentially really, really big, then what you get is panic. And what you get is everybody wants to sell everything at the same time. Uh, and then you don't have a market, markets collapse. And that was even happening in the treasury market, which is usually 
uh, as Nellie said, the most liquid market where there's buyers and sellers and it's a safe haven. It's where people want to be. And yet you couldn't trade the treasury market. Um, and I was on just phone call after phone call with um, our clients who are managing money and they were apocalyptic. I mean, they were panicked. They were looking at, um, uh, you know, dynamics they'd never seen before. So I think um, the good news is that the banking sector, again, wasn't the source of the problem and actually looked to be in really decent shape. Mm -hmm. um, the good news is also that the Fed has tools at the ready, whereas they were making things up on the fly in 2008. So mm -hmm. one of the most important tools they deployed in size immediately, which was buying treasuries and buying mortgages to make sure those very essential markets to the economy keep functioning. Mm -hmm. uh, and they, I mean, they've expanded their balance sheet by $3 trillion in a matter of a couple of months. Uh, that's amazing. And it has worked. Yeah. No, and I think that was a big, I mean, thank God it worked. I mean, but, but as Nellie said, I mean, this was being a lender of last resort is the reason we have a Federal Reserve. It is something they know how to do. And they did it. And they went yeah. all in. I remember with one of my dorky Fed friends, um, I was talking about, I was like, so do you think the 10 year treasury is going to hit zero before the federal funds rate? Um, Cause it was really, it was getting really low. I mean, it's still low today, but it's not like yeah. unforeseen low and, and in chairman Powell, the federal reserve, they cut things to zero. So like the fed funds rate made it there first, but it was really kind of a race to the bottom there um, for a little while. And I will say it was a very exciting month of March. And like the emergency Fed meetings, and there was a lovely like Sunday evening one yes. that I think they did over a phone call, and then yeah. with the journalists, and then like mid sentence at the end, the whole call dropped off with Powell. It was very like dramatic. Um, <laughs> and like he was in a closet. <laughs> <laughs> you know, was, but you know, like I can remember in 2008, it's like we're just going to get this stuff done. Like the pomp and circumstance, you know the the briefings with the formal text. It's like, we don't have time to wait for this. Like we yeah. need to make a decision over the weekend. Um, it always seemed like Rich Miskin was off skiing whenever they need to do something. So we were like, do not let him go on ski slopes yeah. anymore because something falls apart in the world. Um, and he was always like, what, what happened this weekend? <laughs> Things were really fascinating. Um, okay, so enough about March and kind of the, all of that with financial markets. So Nellie, Tell us why, in addition to this was a very different shock and it started in China, like we had some warning, like why, why was it better this time in terms of how we went into this and how, like that wasn't just magic, right? That didn't just happen. So what was it that the Fed did? What was it other regulatory agencies, banks, like what, what was it that happened that made us more robust or more ready for this? Yeah. So. Um there were a few good lessons learned from the 2008 financial crisis. And, you know, one of the key ones was the banking sector didn't have the capital or the quality, enough capital or high enough quality capital to sustain losses in recessions and to keep lending during recessions and not contribute to making them worse. So there's been a whole slew uh, program, Basel III, under the umbrella of Basel III, to improve the capital and liquidity and risk management of banks so that they're prepared for big macro recessions and that they're not going, they're going to have enough capital to survive and maybe keep lending. And so as opposed to sort of creating some of this negative downturn, this down cycle. Um, the U.S. banks hit sort of all their targets. I would say the European banks are still not meeting all the requirements. And so I think at the end, as you were seeing in March and April, we're seeing that there's a big distinction between the strength of the U.S. banks and mm -hmm. the not so strong some of the European banks who are causing even their economies to weaken a little bit more. So I think there's more capital 
Um, the stress tests are one way to enforce that greater capital. And you know, the stress tests for the last X years have been doing, assume there's a big macro scenario, a big macro recession. Now it's nothing on the scale of the kind of, you know, down increase in unemployment we're having now, but assume there's a lot of corporate defaults and assume, you know, interest rates go low for a long time. So in some sense, they've internalized, mm -hmm. they've sort of built this into their risk management. So I think that's part of why they're better prepared. Mm -hmm. But as the banks get more prepared, a lot of the activity is moved to the non-bank sector. Mm -hmm. And that means that firms are relying more on markets for credit. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things we're seeing is less market provided credit than before, because that's, there's more that move there and that doesn't have the support of a strong banking sector. And so the Fed, some of its facilities that it created this time, some of the new programs are to get credit directly to corporations mm -hmm. um, and support corporate credit bond markets and loan markets if they need to. And that's a big step um, for the Fed. Now they're doing it with treasury providing capital mm -hmm. so it's not the fed on its own it's a joint program and it's congress allocating money to say treasury and fed you guys together create something to support businesses who need credit so that we can keep the support the economy and get the recovery going once mm -hmm. once the, you know people start going back to work and spending um so i think that's a, a big a big difference, but it's, you can strengthen the banking sector, but you really want the whole financial sector to be strong. And on net, it is stronger, but it doesn't mean that there aren't parts of the sector that need some help. And so that's where the Fed's been spending a fair amount of new effort on mm -hmm. important to keeping the economy going. Yeah. No, and I will say, Nellie, as usual, you were very modest in how all of this happened. But I mean, just for everybody who's listening, I mean, Nellie played a big role in terms of setting up a division at the Federal Reserve that was very much focused on, okay, how do we get banks to a place where they can still be profitable? I mean, we don't want the banking system to disappear in the United States or be hobbled in a way that they can't lend but also to make sure that they're ready, like they we're all ready for the next recession, it will come, you know, and I know with the stress tests, which weren't always super popular, yeah. um, okay. the bank, it's, yeah. it's more effort, you need a team of people. And sometimes I can imagine, like the last one that was done last year, people are like, seriously, we're gonna prepare for a recession. We're 10 years into this expansion, wow. unemployment's been under 4% for a year. Like it's easy uh -huh. to get a little soft in exactly. terms of preparing, but I think just the fact, A, that like there were like banks individually had to have better, they call risk management, they had yeah. to be prepared. But also one of the things that came out of the financial crisis was understanding like the sum is greater than the parts, right? Exactly. So there was a lot about yeah. systemic risk which not just the board, but there were regulatory agencies. And like, when you talk about Basel III, that's one that is like across the globe, or like there's many different countries um, that participate in that. Um, right. And it's a global, so, so you have a level competitive, a competitive playing field for all banks globally. And so mm -hmm. it, it's an important minimum standard. Yeah, yeah, I think financial stability, just to sort of build on that, it's not just the banks, it's the whole financial sector. Mm -hmm. And financial stability is about making sure the financial sector can support the macro economy. Mm -hmm. And that if there's a shock to the macro economy, the financial sector doesn't make it worse, amplify it and make it worse. That it can actually, um, you know, it will transmit, but it's not gonna make things worse because a firm fails or markets break down. And so on net, the system is much more resilient than it used to be. And that's an important factor. Yeah. So one more question along these lines. Um, so one of the parts of, like you said, monitoring the entire financial sector. So one of the 
the pieces of analysis that came out of your group, and there are reports on this that are public on intervals, was, okay, let's look out at all the parts of the financial sector, the ones that affect households, the ones that affect businesses, um, and, and what's going on, and like have an assessment, like the Fed itself, right. not just have banks tell us like, hey, things are okay, but like really look at all the pieces. So I guess my question is two part. I'm sure you've been following like financial, I can't believe you would actually, you know, hang it up after leaving the Fed. But when you looked out at what was happening, say in February or January of this year, like what did you see as a risk? Mm -hmm. Like what part of the finance? And then did that actually end up being the risk or was there some other part that looked like it was okay and then the world changed so fast that it actually wasn't okay or was we were thought it was better than it was yeah yeah so i think um a couple of things so i don't think we were surprised we you know economists mm -hmm. financial yeah. experts were surprised by everything mm -hmm. but um there's always a few surprises and i think the part of just like macro forecasting in financial stability you can't predict all the shocks you kind of want to look at the structure of the underlying system and say well, for whatever shock there is, how strong, how will it hold up very well? Mm -hmm. And so, and clearly this shock, no one would have predicted and no one would have predicted the scale of this shock. Yeah. Um, but you can say, are banks levered too much so that if anything happened, any slight you know, thing happened, would anyone go down? I think the answer was no. I think there was a view that private funds were getting pretty levered, um, mm -hmm. both the financial, the Fed's financial stability report has highlighted that even the Financial Stability Oversight Council, the FSOC, which was created after the crisis of all the regulatory mm -hmm. organizations to look at financial stability, they were highlighting the growth in leverage at private funds. Mm -hmm. And um, so I think in some ways it was a little shock. You don't know how that leverage when prices start falling is going to play out. But on treasuries that Julia mentioned, there was a massive selling of treasuries and um, dealers weren't able to take it all on their balance sheet. And so the markets, it was hard for them to intermediate the buyers and the sellers and, and match. Mm -hmm. And so prices got a little out of, got out of a line for a while. And so the Fed had to come in. Mm -hmm. um, we've been for years concerned about a business sector that has been taking on too much leverage. So in the 2008 crisis, many households took on a lot of credit to buy mortgages. Mm -hmm. um, that has not been the case, even though prices have been rising, households are buying homes, but the increase in credit growth has not been that high. But businesses have taken on a lot of credit. And um, there've been lots of warnings by financial stability reports in the US and globally about this. So I think some of these businesses are in a pretty bad place in terms of seeing slow economic growth for a couple of years. So it's mm -hmm. going to be, it won't be a surprise to see a lot of defaults and bankruptcies over the next couple of years. Mm -hmm. um, but I think what the Fed can do and the Treasury can do with the CARES Act is try to help the businesses that, you know, didn't so much take on too much leverage, but just got hit by a shock that you know they were asked to close and therefore they got no, have no revenues and so you want to help them sort of get over and bridge to a recovery and that's where the design of these programs to help those kinds of companies get through this they were asked to close to help in some sense the public good Mm -hmm. The government sh is trying to help figure out how to share those losses so the businesses don't have to car carry them all themselves and then get them through to a recovery. And then over time, they can um, pay back that loan. But so that's the key element now that's very different from how the approach to a, a crisis in 2008 was where the problems were the banking sector, not the borrowers. Um, as yeah. much. So I think there's a lot of good things to learn from this. Um, mm -hmm. I think you don't have the moral hazard problems of the government helping those who sort of got you in this bad place to begin with. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so no one just about how to most efficiently help businesses who need help.
Right. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, and the, on the moral hazard. So this yeah. is the idea that if you help someone or some business, then they're going to change their behavior because next time they'll think, oh, well, the Fed is going to bail me out. Exactly. Congress is going to send me money. So I don't need to save. I don't need to do the careful thing, the banks and make the balance sheets. Exactly. Um, I totally agree with you that this concept is not, um, it's not something we should be worried about right now because, you know, pray to God, we don't have another one of these mass yeah. pandemics shut the whole economy down five, 10 years from now. And yet, I mean, this is the kind of things that some economists talk about. Yeah. Did yeah. you know, you don't, you don't want to like take two steps back in terms of having the system be resilient, but we also have to recognize like nobody was prepared for this. Yeah. Yeah. There's and there's some limits too. I mean, if it were a small shock, so I think there's a legitimate argument here. If it's a small shock, do you want the central bank coming in and supporting financial markets in response to any shock all the time. And then if that's the, you know, there's a moral hazard. It's like, but as a lender of last resort, do you expect businesses and households to self-insure against this kind of shock? And, you know, maybe you, if you did that, maybe you wouldn't have much credit growth in the economy. Maybe you would, you know, you'd have like yeah, stability, but no things. growth and, or innovation and, you know, and risk taking. So that's a balance that you have to decide is, you know, what's the right level for the U.S. And those are decisions that, you know, mm -hmm. policymakers have to, yeah, have to make. So. All right. Okay. No, that was, that was really helpful. And I appreciate that. And yeah. now, now that we have Julia back, she like, so we're gonna go to, no, 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 you're fine. <laughs> Just here, all of a sudden. I was going to say, we're going to go to the, like the policy round. So like each okay. of us have, you know, a brief, like what's the one, thing you'd want the Fed to do. I mean, I hope you got the handyman fixing your house. So that's, you know, like we got right now. <laughs> so it's important. We got a lot of problems in the world to solve, but, but here, and obviously there's way more than one thing that each of us would yes. say, Hey, Federal Reserve, it would be great. So why don't I start with Julia? Tell us about like the top of your list for them. So I think first I'll say that they've done a really good job of being aggressive early. And that was sort of the lesson learned from 2008. And I think they've done so well um, getting ahead and short circuiting an economic crisis from becoming a financial crisis. So I think that that's, um, I, I wanna start by saying that. Uh, and then I think what I see as a deeper, longer problem is that um, we're in a world where interest rates are gonna be really low for a very long time, as far as we can see. And so the traditional tool of interest rates just isn't gonna be as effective. Um, and so um, what is their next tool? Their next tool is the balance sheet. Um, but they, you know, there are limitations to that. Um, and so one proposal that, uh, and the limitations being that, again, they can be lender of last resort. They can short circuit financial market tightening. They can't give money out to the economy. And if there's an economy that doesn't want to borrow through the credit channel and respond to low rates, then your impact on the economy is going to be really attenuated, really limited. Mm -hmm. um, so if your goal, if your mandate is to get to full employment and get inflation to your target, you're going to need better tools in this world that we live in. So what do those tools look like though? So this is my pie in the sky. You asked for Go it. Go for it. <laughs> You're gonna get it. Um, my pie in the sky, I have a proposal with Simon Potter for one, the Fed to create a digital currency, uh, a system of digital payment providers for consumers, which is basically formalizing something that's already developing, mm -hmm. um, but bringing it in house, bringing it under the regulatory net, making it backed by reserves at the Fed. Mm -hmm. And then you, you know, all of this would have to be authorized by Congress, who is the Fed's boss at the end of the day, at the beginning and end of the day. Um, and, but that they could be authorized to then use those digital accounts to uh, provide stimulus in a downturn. So we could use a trigger like the SOM rule 
or like hitting the zero lower bound on rates, and then you trigger deposits into people's accounts. That is direct money yeah. creation. So to, not a loan, you just send them money. Not a loan, mm -hmm. it's just money and you're printing it. And, and instead of relying on that credit channel to work, low interest rates stimulate borrowing and that gets money mm -hmm. out into the economy, you're just getting money out into the economy. Yep. And it would have, a, it would be ring fenced. There would be limits mm -hmm. to what they could do. It would be defined in advance, so it's not fiscal policy. It is a monetary function. They're not solving mm -hmm. all problems. In fact, I think if they had that tool this time around, they would be asked to do less of what they're being asked to do right mm -hmm. now, if that makes sense. Yeah. Like now they're being asked to lend to state and local governments and, and medium-sized businesses and um, you know uh, high-yield uh, corporations. Mm -hmm. That's kind of crazy. Um, instead, they could just give money directly to consumers and that in and of itself would reduce the risk that markets are worried about anyway, right? If consumers have a backstop, then that tail risk that markets, that causes markets to seize up wouldn't be as big. Mm -hmm. uh, so can the Fed do this? They would have to be authorized. So okay. we have so to- Congress has got to tell them it's okay. Yeah, so we have a proposal for a framework to do so. Mm -hmm. Those ring fences around it that if Congress authorizes it, that they cannot do it now. They are not allowed to do it now. Yeah. Uh, and otherwise they would, right? But um, uh, we see this as a more, just a more efficient way to maintain that role that the Fed is, is playing now. I, I think what we're seeing is the Fed is being asked to do all kinds of things that it just simply can't do very well. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it sort of puts their independence at risk. Uh, and I think if you give them a better tool, a well-defined but more effective tool, then it can keep doing the job it does well. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. All right, Nellie, it's your turn. Blue skies. <laughs> okay, so um, I'm going to stick with a Fed that uses interest rates and asset purchases and forward guidance as its main tools. Um, and in terms of blue sky for the next year, okay, I think they have a big obligation to try to get more loans out to Main Street businesses. And it is not something that I think is a long-term um, objective for the Fed. It is a response to this crisis. Mm -hmm. And it's an unusual crisis that it hit businesses and they lost money. And Congress has given them money from Treasury to help do this. And, and if once, you know, maybe this isn't a great thing to have to do, but if you're going to do it, then you should do it right. And they should go and be willing to accept some losses on treasury capital for this. I think one of the wrong lessons learned from 2008 is that Congress can allocate some funds like TARP and it will all get paid back and more. Mm -hmm. And somehow that seems to be a view that whatever they gave to businesses in the CARES Act of 454 billion, somehow the treasury is supposed to return that plus more. Or at least mm -hmm. that's how they've internalized their yeah. use of this. And this is a solely different kind of situation where businesses mm -hmm. lost money and somehow you have to socialize those costs, that, that lost revenue across mm -hmm. government and businesses. So I think the Fed really needs to um, get improve this program in ways to mm -hmm. get it to more borrowers. And they use banks. So the Fed's not going to pick who gets mm -hmm. the loans. Yeah. You're using the banks to determine who gets the loans. But it means you need to give conditions to borrowers that are willing to borrow at whatever prices. And banks can participate, like they're not taking on more risk than they can assume. Mm -hmm. um, and then you still have to protect the Fed. So it's a complicated program, but it's doable. And other countries are doing guarantees mm -hmm. on, on mm -hmm. small business loans, or they do funding for lending, which I don't think is as effective. But the guarantees are good. The Fed yeah. hasn't gone that, the Fed and Treasury haven't gone that way yet, but I kind of think that maybe over the next year, next few months, they might have to. Right. Um, but it's important, those small, medium-sized businesses, even those, you know, more than 
you know, 100, you know, even those beyond the like 10 employees or 100 employees, they are big employers. And mm -hmm. we estimate they, you know, employ about 40% of the workforce. You need yeah. to get money to those businesses. Um, so that's my, that's yeah. my pitch for where. No, and, yeah. yeah, no, that's a, that's a very good one. And it, like you said, it's territory the Fed has not been in before. They, they supported, uh, as a lender of last resort in 2008 and afterwards, they went in to make sure the Wall Street, the like financial markets kept functioning. And the argument was always, and it's a valid one, that households and small businesses all benefit if you can still go to the bank and get a loan. Yeah. And so, but they didn't take the step and there are various reasons for this, but they yeah. didn't take the step of directly lending to Main Street, which yeah. this time- But they're gonna do this through banks though. Yeah, so yeah. it does no, require so that the banks be sound enough to actually execute this. Oh, right, yeah, so, yeah, so it's a-, it's a They may not have had that option before. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that, that's a good point. I guess the one thing, so the facilities, so the, the lending facility to the medium-sized banks, the lending facility to municipalities, Yeah. that was announced, if I remember correctly, on April 9th, yes. right before, uh, Chair Powell gave a talk at Brookings with David yes. West. I was absolutely yes. in tears by the end of the talk. I was just like, oh, I love the Fed and Jay Powell. <laughs> like, he's, like, he did a great deal. job that morning. It was yeah, awesome. that was beautiful. Yeah. And then David Wessel had some like really over the top parting words. Um, so, <laughs> but that was April 9th. Those yeah. displays have been announced. The Fed, and I do love like, they don't like tweet out, we're gonna do one thing and then two days later they walk it back because markets freak out about it. Like the Fed is very deliberate and they wanna make sure when they do it, it's gonna work. Unfortunately, in the time that's passed, there are businesses that have gone from being what we call liquid, you know, they're just, they have a problem of like, they don't have enough revenue right now, they can't pay their employees, but it's a temporary thing to businesses that really are, they're going under. And there's yeah. some businesses that already failed that like get absolutely nothing from the Fed. And you mentioned this before, and Julia said to when she talked about high yield, and essentially that's something between junk bond or like we give you loans to businesses that there's a really high probability you're never going to be able to pay us back. Yeah. Right? And so that's the taking losses. And what's unfortunate is in the time that has that has passed, you've had a lot more businesses and municipalities move closer to that yeah you're not paying it back and then these losses i mean i agree we're a victim of our own success with some of the prior bailouts because like oh we give out money and it comes back you know more than we even lent out and that is very unlikely to be the case this yeah. time and if you continue these programs which i think we'll need to the cost will start piling up and people notice like they notice when the deficit gets bigger. No one, I mean, there's a really small fraction of the people that look for the balance sheet releases, the Federal Reserve, and get all excited about, oh, there's more money. Um, Wait, what? <laughs> it's a different, yeah, thing. But no, I think that's good. And I, one thing that I've heard talked about, it made me very angry with a whole uh, series of macro academic men, is the idea that be, the Fed is just out of ammo. Like, I think it's important to think about it's what Julia's what? saying out of ammo, like that they're just not gonna be able to do anything. So Julia's point, and I do agree, in a low interest rate environment, and this is not going away, we need to think about other tools. Right. The Federal Reserve is like totally woke to this. They spent like the better part of last year doing listening sessions yeah. and FOMC meetings, which I imagine were something like paint drying, like some of the discussions. Uh, but like they were on to it. Yeah. And in June, this month was supposed to be when we learned about the outcomes yeah. of all these discussions. I have a feeling, well, I actually think what, what, and I don't know this, but I feel like sometime in March, they like moved past everything that had been a serious discussion in Fed listens or in their framework review, but they were ready to keep acting. And I saw this in 2008 in the recovery, you know, they hit the zero lower bound and really anything past that had been a very like theoretical exercise before it happened. And then it's like, well, we're not giving up. It's like, we'll do quantitative easing and we'll do forward guidance. And we'll, you know, so to me, the Fed had proved 
last time. Like, I don't think they did enough and I don't think they were bold enough, but like they got the principle of you just keep doing like what we're doing and like, what's the blue sky? Um, yeah. Yeah. And in fact, one of my favorite stories, and I never was able to like get the goods on this exactly because um, they know better than to give me things I shouldn't have, um, was that Ben Bernanke is supposed somewhere in you don't have to verify this, Nellie, but I'm sure you had one of these uh, somewhere early, like maybe like 2010, 2011, where, when things were getting really complicated again, uh, Ben Bernanke was said to have sent out what, like the subject line of emails that said blue sky, like blue sky mm -hmm. thinking. And it just would go to senior staff and like, okay, what do we do? And I even heard another story last week about him just walking into Janet Yellen's office. There was a senior staffer in there and he just, he's like, Janet, what do we do next? And she looked to the staff and is like, what do you think we do next? And he's like, oh my God. So, but to me, that's the kind of, and it wasn't they were doing things willy nilly. Like the Fed never acts without having thought through it, but just the fact that they'll step back and be like, okay, what do we do next? Like, I, I would like to see more of this blue sky thinking in Congress, but you know, mm -hmm. we got what we got. Um, okay, so I'll close this out with what my, um, blue yeah. sky yeah. right yeah. now and actually a lot of what you've already said like I totally agree with that but we need like diverse perspectives here mm -hmm. so one of the tools that the Federal Reserve used after the financial crisis and they are using to some extent now is this uh, communication policy like mm -hmm. they tell us I think one that's really important right now is the Fed saying we will do whatever it takes which is a famous line from Mario Draghi who is in charge of the European Central Bank but the idea is, is the Fed isn't going to step away until people are back on their feet. And, and I think from the Fed, it's a credible, like you can argue about whether they've got all the best tools and if they'll stay out of the political firestorm long enough, but they want to like have that commitment. So I'm all on board with this. One of the things that I would love to see with communication policy is they just throw Fed speak in the trash, right? And I think Jay Powell has done a lot to bring the message of the Fed out in a way that people listening could understand. Like he tries, I think it actually benefits us all that he is not an academic macroeconomist. And he's a very smart man. He totally wants to understand the economy. He totally hangs out on uh, financial and economic Twitter. Um, <laughs> like this is, and he gets the message out, but you can still see in his prepared text, um, his speech, like it's still very, tight um and i've actually worked with hill staff in terms of okay claudia how can what questions should we ask him to get him to say that congress should do something i mean you really got to craft a sentence very finely because i'm like okay we got to surprise him because it can't be in the 700 page briefing book and like there are just certain things he's never gonna say and at this point, and he kind of like in the last thing, well, Congress might need to do more. And, but it's like, you know what, just take the gloves off. Like at this point, unless they give them more authority, the Federal Reserve cannot do this alone. They had too much that was put on them in the last recession. And like, we will all pay for like pussyfooting around like what actually needs to be done. Now that creates like all kinds of coordination and Fed chairs aren't supposed to do that. And the reason I left is so I could work with Hill staff because like Fed staff can't do that. But at some point it's like, you're already tightly linked. I mean, the Fed is always linked to like Congress created it. Congress can stop it. It, you know, there is a connection always. And at this point it's like, you're just making believe if you think, you know, some coded words will keep you out of trouble. But like that isn't yeah. gonna happen. I'm not gonna get to replace Michelle Smith as like the head of public affairs, nor do I want to. Her job is really well, hard. That's, that's an amazing thing to imagine though, Claudia. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. but it is, I think that's one. And I've taken a lot of time um, and I do it kind of in jest on Twitter sometimes. I'll do like, um, I have these tweets I do, they're like Fed speak translation. And so I'll take some journalists will have quoted something from testimony and I'll be like, you know, all caps, you know, exclamation points, what the Fed is saying. And I mean, in some ways after being there and you all have this, like when we see a, a release, a press release from the Fed or we watch a testimony, we hear more than a lot of people hear because there's a mm -hmm. way you write it. There's a way like, anyways, and that's just, it is what it is. But I think at moments like this, 
it makes it harder. Like I believe them when they speak and I get it, but I don't, well, now they're like lending to small businesses and municipalities. Those people do not have the, the Fed decoder ring. So, but they'll get there. So anyways, and if they need any advice, <laughs> they know where to, they know where to go look for it. So, okay. Well, once again, I really appreciate you all taking time. I know this is a very busy, very disturbing. I mean, the last week or so has just been absolutely hard. You know, we focus on the economy and for, weeks I've been like this is a really severe recession all of us said that and I said at some point like this isn't about economics it's about our social fabric and to actually see that start to tear this last week is just really hard um but you know we're economists we stay in our lane okay. we're, and you know so anyways but I really appreciate this was a great conversation and all of you stay healthy and take care so. sure thank you thanks all right. you too